Wow, praise the Lord. Good morning. Hello, everyone watching online this early in the morning. We welcome you. And those who are listening on podcast, praise God. Uh, so what was Pastor Jim mentioning about the clock? Why do we always give blame for the clock? I don't understand that. There was this, uh, this father, he has a little son, and they were le- very little. They were leaving church one Sunday. And uh, the pastor just, how can you say this, didn't know when to stop, you know? So father's not happy. And they're leaving church, you know, the little kid says to his father, Daddy, oh, yes, dear. Uh, the pastor said something I didn't understand. What was that? The word in conclusion. What does that mean? Father stopped, looked at his watch. It means nothing, nothing whatsoever, son. <laughs> Why do we get blamed? I don't understand. Well, I have the privilege today of bringing the third topic in our creed series. Uh, we've been examining the Apostles' Creed, and we've been basing it primarily here on Pastor Walt's book, uh, if you have not purchased this already, I highly, highly recommend you do that. Uh, now, they were selling it last Sunday after church. Th- this Sunday, they're not. But when you get a chance, if you don't own one, you really want to own one. This is a really quality book that he wrote, uh, especially now since he's gone home to be with the Lord. Uh, it's um, something, you know, you want to own. Uh, I have an autographed copy. You can't have mine. But... Uh, Anyway, it's uh, really, really good what he put together. I'm glad he did this. I remember Pastor Walt had said, uh, I don't know how often he said this, he said uh, once his calling to the body of Christ was to teach the church how to be church. And he certainly had an anointing to do that. So a lot of those thoughts are in this book and really um, uh, definitely recommended here. So uh, our first sermon topic we had and when the creed began on October 2nd, uh, Pastor James Wheeler did a great job uh, on an introduction um, and foundational comments on the creed. So I won't repeat that. If you want to, if you didn't hear that, please listen to the podcast on our church website, worth listening to. Um, you know, so much can be said about the Apostles' Creed. Um, uh, it has been uh, such an important confession of what we believe. Uh, from Christians for centuries. Uh, So to add my two cents, uh, the body of Christ could say and has said over the years, if you don't believe this, you're not a Christian. How about that? A lot of these creeds started in the very early years of the church because of so much wrong teaching that was out there. You know, the early fathers had to say, wait a minute, what do we believe? And through a lot of um, painstaking uh, discussions and, and, and meetings, and some of these people at those meetings were second or third generation disciples of, of uh, Peter and John, so they had really access to information we don't have today. They came up with these things, and there's more than one of them, and this, the one we're using is, is a very common one, and um, we need to know what we believe. Even more important, why do I believe what we believe? And the sermons kind of like are on the why we should believe this and why we would make such a statement like that. I remember I heard Anthony Aquilino one time at our church. He had served here as an elder and pastor in former years. Today he teaches at our Bible school. And um, he had said something once I never forgot and I've always kept with me. Um, I heard him make a statement one time um, that regarding the creed, the Apostles' Creed, it's not as much what he believes. It's beyond what he believes. It's what he's willing to die for. And that is a good understanding of what a creed is. This is what I'm willing to die for. It is how do you uh, whittle this down to the basics of if you're not believing this, you're not a Christian, and am I willing to die for this? And the answer is yes. And if you notice, not a lot is written in there. A lot of things Christians would teach and believe, which are valid, Nothing about spiritual gifts or tongues, which I strongly believe in. I'm not willing to die for that. You follow? What am I willing to die for? The elements of what this is to be a believer. So this becomes very, very important to us. Um, So the part of the creed that I'd like to share on today is the lines, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary. So let's pray here. Uh, Father God, we just ask Holy Spirit today to bring light to us. Uh, that, Father God, you would illuminate the thoughts of our heart, Father. That, Lord God, we would leave here greater than when we have come in, in greater belief and firm foundation of who Christ is. 
and why he is our life. And we thank you for this, Father, for more light to come into us, that we would have even greater conviction. We thank you for this today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, uh, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary. These lines actually stand as truths by themselves, yet they're tied together. And they're also essential beliefs that verify the verse that comes before this, that I believe in Jesus. And uh, that's the Messiah. Uh, so there are foundation verses to support that great statement, I believe in Jesus. He's my Savior. Uh, there's gospel accounts in, of Jesus' birth, one in Matthew, one in Luke. Matthew written to the Jewish audience, uh, Luke to the Gentile Greek audience. So I guess you might say this is almost a Christmas message today in October. Why not? Every day is Christmas, right? Uh, and every day we, we live in the joy of the Messiah that's coming toward the world. For the believer, he lives in me daily. So it's great. So for those of you who like to keep your Christmas decorations up all year long, go ahead and do it. Who cares? It's all good. But here we have an important foundation from Isaiah chapter 7 here in verse 14. We have an amazing prophetic verse. Uh, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold. Now, this is interesting. The Lord here refers to Jehovah God, who is Jesus. This is amazing. What he's talking about himself. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and she will name him Emmanuel. Wow. The himself part is neat because the himself is, is, that's me coming, he's literally telling you. And she shall name him Emmanuel. Now, Emmanuel is not literally the baby's name. The angel tells Mary it's Jesus. Uh, But Emmanuel simply means in Hebrew, God with us. So it's a statement of who Jesus is. God is with you. This is what you look at when you see this child. God is with you. Here it says the Lord himself. He's with you now, himself. And... um, He is, of course, the second person of the Godhead, Jehovah God, the personal aspect of the Godhead. And uh, he now takes on a body and physical form and is among his people. That's amazing. So here we have Mary, who was engaged to Joseph to be married. In both Gospels, it shows that they are of the house of David. So that means we got a royal birth that's taking place here. It's heavy stuff. And, of course, the angel visits Joseph and uh, tells him that Mary is already with child. And from the NIV translation in Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, it says, What is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. That's a heavy. Of the Holy Spirit. Um, Many wonderful things here could be said about Mary. Of course, that's not a Hebrew name. Her name was more than likely Miriam. Um, And you have to remember, when we read all this about Jesus' birth, we have to remember this all takes place before Jesus rises from the dead. That means these are Old Testament times, not New Testament yet. These are literally prophetic Old Testament times. So Mary then is an Old Testament hero. We need to see her like that. She's a picture of um, a a submitted humility to the will of God. Um, She's a picture of purity, faith. A picture of what the best of an Old Testament Jew could be. Um, And a lot of people want to know, gee, how old was Mary when Jesus was born? We really don't know. But it's most likely believed she was less than 14 years old or younger than 14. That's a pretty much assumed correct uh, age prior to the age of 14. So why a virgin birth here? That's the big question for us. And you have a fill in the blank there, which is nice. Take away with you. So the blank here, number one, is showing us here that mankind was trapped in the condition of spiritual death towards God due to Adam's sin. Very, very serious. This is the condition of mankind after Adam's sin. Scripture tells us Eve was deceived. Adam knew exactly what he was doing. And he sells out in a sin of high treason the entire creation to the evil one to grab it. So... God has a problem here. No problem for God. God has to get his man back. So man needed to be redeemed, to be bought back. He's in hock. He needs to be bought back. So the Bible is a massive love story of the plan of redemption. 
of how God gets his man back. And we say man, we're talking about men and women. We're talking about men in generic. We're talking about men and women. God wants his man back because he loves his man. He was going to go to extreme lengths to get his man back. So, God, so man here, he is helpless to do this for himself. God had to make the first move to do this. So for God to do this in a way that he had to satisfy the eternal needs of justice and not take advantage of Satan because he's God. So Satan is a creation, not in God's class. So God had to devise a plan here, which he already knew. Your second fill in the blank here, uh, Jesus and Jesus alone would pay the price to free us by the shedding of his sinless blood. The shedding of sinless blood are the demands of eternal justice now. And this shedding of sinless blood would satisfy these requirements of eternal justice. And then we could put our faith in him, in his eternal work, and find newness of life and be born again to be with the Father for eternity. It's like when we send our armies to war and they win the war, they fight for us. They are our heroes. We identify with their victory. It's now our victory. Likewise, Jesus' victory is my victory now, if I would believe him and put faith in him. The problem is that Jesus is going to have to enter the human race without sin. Because Adam's race is now tainted with spiritual death from birth. Every single human being, when they know the difference between right and wrong, will choose sin and they will die spiritually. And Adam's sin is now going to reign for all. So, Jesus had to be born here without the human race's sin and have sinless blood. It tells us in the book of Leviticus that life is in the blood. Big issue all through the Old Testament. This blood issue is very big. It's a common theme through the entire Old Testament. And here we have in our third fill in the blank, uh, the God solution to this problem was that Jesus had to be born from heaven, yet by a mother of purity. So consider here, we can't talk too deeply today about it, but consider here, uh, male and female both contribute to the conception of a child. We know that. But it's from the, ma the male, however, who contributes to the blood, the nature of spiritual death to the unborn baby. So then Holy Spirit here contributes the male aspect to this virgin woman who is contributing the human aspect. Then what we have here in your film, the blank number four, Jesus being born as all, all God and all man in one individual. That's real important. The only one in human history who had sinless blood that could redeem us from our nature of sin. Paul calls him the second Adam, in, I think in the book of Romans. The first Adam blew it, the second Adam did not. He got it right. So, <clears throat> we need, <clears throat> the need here is for someone who could be all God and all man. This is a revelation from God all through the Old Testament in earlier times. Even pagan civilizations had a craving for this. Uh, when you look at, you know, Greek and Roman mythology, their gods were godmen, if you noticed. They were men, but yet they were gods. That's the same concept, this craving in mankind, who would be all God, all man. But the reality is, it is Jesus. Um, in fact, we have this amazing prophetic statement here from the book of Job. And I really have to pause for a second because so many misunderstood Job. Job is not a book about how to suffer. That is not what this book is about. Job is a poetry book. It's one of the poetry books of the Old Testament. And you don't read poetry like you read a narrative, book of Numbers, Exodus, their narratives. This is poetry. You have to read poetry very different. And it's like a play, like you're reading a play. It's a real true event. But here in the book of Job, uh, it's a very old book. And it probably chronologically fits around Genesis chapter 12. It's pre-Abraham. So Job is a person that does not know a personal God. All he knows is the almightiness of God. He doesn't understand what's happening to him. And he's suffering outrageously greatly. Um, so here we have, he's trying to figure this out and understand what's happening to him. Because he knows nothing. And in Job chapter 9, verse 20, I'm sorry, verse 32 and 33, now we have a real important theme of what this book is really about. He's regarding uh, almighty God. He says, for he is not a man as I am, that I may answer him. 
that we may go to court together. In other words, equality and fairness. There is no umpire between us who may lay his hands on both of us, that is, understand both sides at the same time. Will somebody help me? What do I do? Job is a picture of suffering humanity of what they look like in the spirit realm without Christ. His life is a picture, an allegory of spiritual death. And of course, if you read Job carefully, the way this guy physically suffers, it is outrageous. That's humanity suffering in the spirit realm with no hope. And, you know, he's like crying out here spiritually, who will help me? Who can understand my dreadful condition? Well, the Apostle Paul gives us an answer to this because that scripture in Job connects directly to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, where Paul reveals to us, there is one God and one mediator also between God and mankind, the man, Christ Jesus. Jesus is now this umpire that Job was crying out for, that, uh, that, uh, that humanity was crying out for prior to Christ's coming who can satisfy both sides with equality. This child now being born of the virgin, having the sinless blood, can be that substitute for the man that can touch both deity and humanity in one individual, be that umpire, the mediator that Job craved for thousands of years earlier. I just said a lot. That's a lot of heavy stuff. If you want a further explanation on, on a lot of this, here in Pastor Walt's book here, in chapter 3, he goes in a lot more detail, especially on the blood issue, giving a lot more understanding about that, of why a virgin birth, why blood is so important. Uh, so, a virgin birth here is by Holy Spirit. So, we see here that um, Jesus has no earthly father. He has no tie to man's sin, to Adam's sin. That's inherited through the father's line. He is now the sinless, unblemished lamb for the final sacrifice. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 here, verse 21, it tells us, For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. You know, there's nothing greater on the face of this earth to be right with God. Amen. Nothing. Nothing. Today, we live very long lives on the earth, but yet many years ago, a lot of people never saw 40. Very common. Never saw 40. It was very, very common of yesteryear. So uh, they were very conscious, let's say, of their mortality. And um, uh, we tend to, you know, uh, not think about uh, graves and stuff. That's why people don't like to go to funerals, because uh, it reminds them of their own mortality. But yet, Mortal means death doomed. And to be in the human race is to be death doomed. The promise one day of a new body, a glorified body. Ah, that's the fullness of our salvation scene. But here, all because of Jesus, we're right with God. And that's more important than anything this side of heaven that we could ever imagine. So all through the Bible, way back to the beginning of Genesis, we have this truth about the blood covenant being revealed to man. Uh, from the earliest evidence here, right after Adam sins, sinned, we have the foreshadow first given in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. It says, and the Lord God, that's Jehovah again, and the Lord God made garments of, sin, of, of skin, garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Where did he get these garments from? He didn't go to the, to the garment maker. No, he shed animals' blood for the, for the skins. Isn't that wild? These animals had to give up their lives for their skin so they would be clothed with it. A first picture, a first prophetic foreshadow of the blood covenant, all through the Old Testament revealed. So it's one of the most important early verses here in Genesis, foreshadowing the blood being shed to cover sin. But now Jesus can be born of sinless blood, and he wouldn't cover our sin as they only could know in the Old Testament, he could eradicate now our sin nature that man was plagued with if we would put our faith in him. So man's problem since uh, Adam's sin has always been a blood problem. And only the Godhead could have made a possible solution for this. So the revelation of the blood covenant here was man's solution to the problem 
one the evil one never saw coming. So because of Jesus, you and I now have a mediator between God and us who can understand my human condition, our human condition. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things, just as we are, yet without sin. And the point here of the creed, a virgin birth made all this possible. Jesus is still the most unique human ever born in the history of the human race. The one with sinless blood, that's the key. Mary's faithfulness by submitting to the will of God allowed Jesus to come and save all of us in humanity if we put our faith in him. So Pastor Walt's book here, I like his title, Living the Apostles' Creed. It's not something I'm, I just say over and over again. I want to live this out. What does that mean? So well, let's look at the first three statements of this creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. That was our first week. Second week. And Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, and now we're at today, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary. So for us today, we need, what do we need to take away, with, away from the message I'm trying to present here? I think, I think we very much have to stop and pause and take away questions. Do I believe this? Do I believe this? Uh, my topic today that we looked at, the conception of Jesus and his virgin birth. Um, have I applied the blood of Jesus to me? Have I had that blood transfusion from heaven that removes my sin nature once and for all that I was born with and could not help myself? On your sheet there, you have a memory verse that I consider so incredibly important from the book of John. John chapter 5, verse 24, we have Jesus speaking. Truly, truly, I say to you, oh, we got to stop there again. Truly, truly is an Aramaic expression. Some translations uh, translated as, this is the truth I tell you. Verily, verily, I saith unto you. It's an Aramaic expression which means what I'm about to say, you won't believe. You'll call me a liar. In that day, they used to put their hand to heaven when they said that truly, truly, so that you would know, what are they going to say? They're not lying to me. Anytime Jesus says this, he drops bombs on the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, he who believes in me shall never die. All these bombs he drops, which they had to go, huh, what, huh? Here he drops one. Truly, truly, I say to you, the one who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment. He has passed out of death into life. Isn't that good to know? There's no judgment awaiting you unto damnation if you're a believer. We have a judgment unto rewards that we'll receive, but not unto damnation. We are not Christ rejectors if you're a believer. You're a believer. You believe the Father that Jesus is now my Messiah. So many people beat themselves up because of failures that we've had in life. If Jesus is your Savior and you've applied the blood of Jesus to you, there is no judgment for you. You have passed out of judgment. Father God doesn't look down and look upon us and see that, there they go again, messing up. He sees Jesus before he sees us, and therefore we're pleasing. That's amazing. My mind can't wrap around that. That's why it's such an important verse here. I have passed out of judgment. Have you believed on Jesus? There's people watching on the online, listening to a podcast. Have you received that eternal life Jesus speaks of? You should ask the question, uh, how do I do this? Uh, don't you just go to church? Isn't just being born into a Christian family all that matters? No. God has no grandchildren. Only sons and daughters. People who have individually made Jesus the Lord of their lives. And he now becomes their Father God. Not only the Almighty God of the universe, Father God. In Romans here, chapter 10, the Apostle Paul tells us how to do this. Verse 9, 10, and 13 if you would confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness or a right standing with God. With the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation, a wholeness that come to us. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. 
since I don't know, perhaps everyone who's here today physically in church or who's listening online or podcast or who would in the future, I'd like to close this morning um, to lead you into a prayer. Uh, those of you who have listened to what I've presented, a confession prayer. Uh, please repeat after me. Please remember also saving, saying these words do not save you. Believing in them do. Please repeat after me. I believe in my heart today that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe Jesus is Lord. I believe he was raised from the dead for my sin. For me to have right standing with you, almighty God. I now call upon the name of the Lord, the name of Jesus, to save me. Jesus, come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. I surrender my life to you today. Forgive my sins. You are my sin sacrifice. Thank you now, Almighty God, that you are now my Father God, and Jesus is my Savior. Amen.